Hello, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. <laughs> Where are we today, Gabriel Blake? We're still quarantined. <laughs> but we are almost done. Almost. Hopefully. Did extended to like May 15th? Are you serious, man? I thought it was May yeah. 3rd. Okay. Uh, we should Google this later. Yeah, yeah, my heart is broken. One more week. 12 more days, actually. And probably the bars are not going to be open the first day. So. But I bet Troy could get us into the Eagle. <laughs> Shout out to Troy at the Eagle, the best gay bartender in San Francisco. Yeah, in the very, very weird coincidence that you, Troy, are listening to this, our cups go up to you. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what movie did we watch today? Well, today, or yesterday, or whenever? I definitely watched it like two hours ago. So, um, yeah. we watched the 2011 Norwegian film Headhunters. And I think that it was your pick. Why did you pick it? Uh, so... We've been watching a lot of stuff that I felt has required a lot of emotional energy to be invested in it. And I wanted something a little bit lighter. And I typically like how dark Norwegian... So when I say lighter, I don't mean lighter like happy, go lucky. I mean like something that doesn't require me to think. Do you think that I like Mandy... Scandinavian films. Okay. Huh? Do you think that Mandy... No, requires... I'm talking about the movies I pick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You wanted, you wanted to just level with me. <laughs> okay. I wanted to find my version of Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. That's a good point. <laughs> I really like Scandinavian films. They're super fucking dark. I don't know why who hurt those people, but they are dark as shit. And typically, I really like them. Like the movies, not the Norwegians or the Swedes. But... Gotcha. Can you tell me so of a I... movie, a Norwegian movie that you consider like really dark? Um, now I'm going to embarrass myself if I don't know whether it's Swedish or Norwegian. But have well, you seen this? From that area. Nordic. Reprise. Amazing. Oh, okay. Joaquin Trier. There was this mind-blowing film. In fact, I thought about us talking about it here from like 10 years ago called Flick Telig Lick Telig. And it's about like a small town murder with bad cops. Oh, and okay. It just blew my mind. Um, and I want to be clear when I say Scandinavian I am definitely not including Finland <laughs> why not can you name a Finnish film I think I can yeah and it's terrible because there's well I don't want to just you know like spoil <laughs> what I think about this movie but I thought about <gasps> it. <laughs> but I was thinking about this movie that I was watching on filming that it doesn't sport, it doesn't sponsor this program, but it should. Uh, that is called Heavy Trip. That is about the vicissitudes and the adventures of a Finnish uh, heavy metal band. So that's oh, the only, yeah, and it's terrible. But you know, I don't include them in Scandinavia. <laughs> They're like the ugly redheaded stepchild of Scandinavia. <laughs> so. Well, I literally Googled dark Scandinavian films 20th century, found this list of acclaimed Scandinavian films, checked Rotten Tomatoes to be sure that it was good, okay. which it has 93% on. I read the briefest synopsis and was like, yeah, let's do it. And that's all I knew about it. All right. Gotcha. Uh, so should I give my opinion? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For those that cannot see us, that is like basically everyone in the world except you and me, uh, he really hesitated for a moment and, st <laughs> and struggled with it. Uh, so I have to say that I felt like really surprised that you picked this movie because my opinion about it is that it feels like a, a straight-to-TV thriller <gasps> with, a component, with a component of... But I have a moral to this story. Basically, the story is about this guy that he opens the movie, and there's going to be spoilers. Uh, he opens the movie saying that he's really short and he has to compensate 
for some of you know the kind of complexes that he has. And supposedly it's going to be about our thieves. Supposedly. No, that's what the opening says, that he actually is a headhunter for a GPS company, but at the same time, in his spare time, he steals art. And he does it in order to just pay for a very expensive life that he thinks that his wife wants and needs. And that's the only reason why I see that is like a gorgeous woman is with him, a five, six guy. No? God, she's hot. She's yeah. hot. But yeah. yes, everything you said is true. Yeah. So uh, the story just shifts when they meet uh, Jamie Lannister. That he takes a break from Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, and uh, he plays a CEO from a competing company from the Netherlands, I think. And he starts... No? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So then the comp the story just starts shifting like pretty quickly because supposedly he has a a remnant. No, what is the the, the Ruben. building? That, a Rubens. It's a Rubens. Uh, he has a Rubens in his apartment that he inherited from his mother, from his grandmother, and he's going to be stealing. So he gets him in contact with the company for just doing an interview and meanwhile stealing his painting. But then it's not about that, and he's going to get killed. Because he is basically the guy had this kind of plot for just getting this role as this new CEO for this company because the, his original company is completely in bankruptcy and that way he probably is going to be acquiring the new company and just saving the day. But he's using everyone around, like the uh, mistress that the five, six guy has, the wife, and even the guy himself for just forcing him to steal the painting. So, I don't know, it felt almost like this kind of charade, part of it. The other part felt like a thriller. Some parts of it, it felt like very, I don't know, even like highlighted. Very like... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I think it was supposed to be comedy. A comedy in parts. But other parts is like, for example, when they face the camera for five seconds into someone that just lost his face, <laughs> basically an accident. And you can see like the face completely destroyed. I love the violence. <laughs> They have like a lot of violence. You can see how they actually just a pit bull gets involved into a tractor. Oh, I got really upset in that scene. Yeah. It's like, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. So like, okay, you're trying to make like this kind of dark psycho thriller kind of thing, or is like a very like hard of adventure, especially with the ending when he actually says like, well, and besides that, I'm really accomplished. I did all the good stuff. Even my wife loved me in spite of not being a rich guy. We're going to have a kid, and I'm 5'6". <laughs> and that's almost, enough. That's enough. <laughs> it almost <laughs> felt like, look, is this some kind of fable? Is this kind of some lost chapter from uh, from a shop or something like that? He's like, what is the point? Of this I mean, I, I get the point that is like even in spite of all the compass that he had, is that he went into this kind of... Uh, murder spree or just being part of that murder spree that the other guy is uh, driving and at the end you know he's a seated he's a better person now yeah I have to say I'm really surprised at the reviews on this one because the reviews are so good <laughs> what the hell this is yeah. a terrible movie it like it wasn't funny like it was supposed to be black comedy right but it wasn't really funny. The gore was super over the top. It wasn't clever. Like these, like, um, when they have the big twists and turns and um, yeah. clues. And I just, I don't, I don't know. Scandinavia really let me down. Yeah. I mean, I had to say that uh, when I was checking the reviews, and Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 93, I think, 93%. It reminded me of uh, Paddington Bear 2 that one year or two years ago, he had a 100%. You Which know? one? Cars 2? No, Paddington Bear 2. Oh. And I think that we discussed about this, but that's one of the reasons why I don't like Rotten Tomatoes' score, just as a single indicator. Because he's like, this movie is not atrocious. It's not atrocious. Did you read the reviews? It's no, not Rotten Tomatoes' fart. Those reviews are fucking good. They talk about how this is a masterpiece. 
I well, sure. Uh, it has a seventy-two percent in Metacritic. That is like twenty percent no, more no, than this movie. But it's a Metacritic is a score that is it makes more sense than Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes is about like is it over fifty or not? And that's it. Well, we disagree about this fundamentally, but in you, in this case, you're right. Rotten Tomatoes was off. Well, Rotten Tomatoes was not off. The critics that reviewed this movie are off. <laughs> sure, but I'm telling you, this is the same case as Paddington Bear 2. It has a 100. If you actually go to check the scores of uh, of Paddington Bear 2, uh, Paddington 2, you didn't have bear in the title, uh, it has an 88 in Metacritic 2. Wow. That is insane. Now, I have to say, I watched it, and what I could say, just because of the reason, it's like, it has a 100%. It has like crazy scores. So I watched it, it's like, look, for just being kids cinema, it's good. And I think that it actually, there is a bit more of a mass uh, review bias when it actually belongs to a specific genres, you know? So if a movie is a thriller, is that you actually assume that it's like as long as there is a twist that it gets me like, eh, you know, that's okay. And the twist here is okay, you know, that the other guy is not only having an affair with the wife, but it also wants to kill him because he's after the work. So he manipulates everyone. It's, like, it's not a good twist, but it's like, it's okay. And besides that, it's a Nordic film. I have the feeling that it's like many critics are going to be like just moving the bar I will lower and say, like, this is amazing because the odds of you watching this are so low that I'm going to sound super smart saying that this is good. This is the first Norwegian film to ever be nominated for a BAFTA. The first. <laughs> for best foreign language film. What wait, happened wait, wait, wait. in 2011? Are you saying BAFTA or BAFTA? <laughs> oh, my God. Shame on you. Come on, same on me, but it's like this movie is not a masterpiece. And when I was watching it, I was thinking, like, well, I even have the feeling that maybe the reason why Blake picked this is because he wants to test me to see if I'm going to be like calling it out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or he's like seriously thinking that this would be good. And that was one of the reasons why I told you before we started recording. He's like, we're going to start saying why we picked the movie. Mm. So this is a direct reaction to my choice for this film. <laughs> yeah. And just today when I was asking you if you watch it, you know, already I was like, oh, <laughs> this is this so a surprise. So when you wrote to me and said, is this really the movie you picked? Had you seen it at that point or no? I, I was an hour into it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> maybe there is, maybe, maybe this is like burning, you know, that there is a payoff at the end, you know, or maybe she's like, wow, that, no. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting this movie to have a payoff. And holy shit, if it did, he's like, five, six was enough. <laughs> That's what he says. So, I, uh, you know, it's based on a very popular Norwegian book. Like, very, very popular. I assume that that was the case, because in some of the reviews that I uh, skim over, they mention uh, Stig Larsson and the Millennium Trilogy. So it made me wonder if, because it's like such a beloved text... Maybe that's why everyone was just so happy to see a movie of it. So you realize some of the reviews. Uh, do you think that all those reviewers watched, sorry, read the original book? No. <laughs> I could believe Listen to what Roger Ebert, admittedly one of the most middle-of-the-road critics ever, but this okay. is what he said. He gave it three and a half out of four stars. And he said, um, he praises the film as quote, an argument for the kinds of thrillers I miss. It entertains with story elements in which the scares evolve from human behavior. Unlike too many thrillers that depend on stunts, special effects, and the queasy cam, this one devises a plot where it matters where it matters what happens. It's not all kinetic energy. I so, it 3.5 out of 4 stars. What is it called? Uh, oh, yeah, like a septic, uh, septic tank. We have to remember that there is an scene on this movie while the main, when the main guy actually just submerged himself into a septic tank. Oh, God. That so and that is seen less like a couple of minutes. So maybe yeah. it's not a stance, but it's like I wouldn't call this sophisticated cinema. 
I, I can't. I'm no. sorry. You know, this is like the kind of entertainment that is there. Look, if you are drunk or high or you know all the TV has gone dark and this is the only channel that you have, is that you go watch it. Maybe you will pick this over reading or cleaning the house, but that's basically it. Yeah, you know, I have, this is like Celine Dion goes boating. You sh I should be embarrassed for picking it. <laughs> I love that you still keep calling it that. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I was really disappointed. I was like 30 minutes in, I was like really an hour and 40 minutes. This could have been done in like 50. <laughs> Probably. Probably. None I of mean, the twists were even interesting. I mean, the most interesting thing was the actual Rubens. And then yeah. that wasn't even real. I was like, what? So all of this is... Oh. That's the reason what I was saying, that the movie opens. It's true that he talks about his uh, height in the second sentence of the movie, because the first one is about our thieves. That's the first one. So what you assume is that the whole movie is going to be about him stealing something, and the police trying to capture him. Basically like that Pierce Brahman movie from the 90s. Don't. I loved that movie. I you do? I, I did when it came out, when I was like 12. <laughs> it was the uh, the secret of something. I, I don't remember. Well, it doesn't matter. With like, Rene Russo? Rene, Rene Russo, maybe? Uh, Pierce Brahman. Uh, da, 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 God. Let's see. Anything still? No, no. Uh, Thomas Crown Affair? Yes, Is that's Thomas it. Crown, Thomas Crown Affair. Yeah. Yeah, and it was Rene Russo. Yeah. So basically, that movie. Wow, about, look at that memory. Yeah, that's good. Uh, basically, that movie was about a guy that he was rich, he had everything, and he was stealing art just for keeping it. He's a bit more a guy that doesn't have anything, that has nothing. He steals the uh, the art for just paying a life that he cannot afford. And I understand that, at least at the beginning, that they try to keep some kind of secret to the character, but that everything else from that point is so out of a manual, out of a script writing manual, that is like, so he has a mistress, when he has a wife that he cannot afford. But even when they present the mistress, it almost felt like a comedy thing. It almost felt like, we're not going to be like taking it seriously. But then when they when he discovers that his wife is having an affair with this guy, it's pretty tragic, you know? And I feel like even from a gender I perspective, it's like, it's, it's like, this is wrong. <laughs> is it that you're doing this? Well, he actually had an affair at the beginning and it almost felt like a comedy kind of thing. Is that like, this is just bizarre. And at the end, he ends up killing that girl, Lotte, I think that was her name. Yeah, and they never resolve that because at the end it's like they tried the guy that wrote the script that I don't want to even check who that is is like he tried to be smart and say like well the only uh, loose point that I had is like the time of death of this guy was not matching with the time that he was killed like, well you, you also killed this woman and you're not trying to address that that woman was found dead on her apartment and probably they're going to try to connect her with something. You didn't take her phone. That phone call was connected with this guy. How was that guy there? Is it, it was like completely left open. Like, okay, yep. that's too much. Tons of plot so holes, to tons. Yeah. So it felt like lazy screenplay, you know, screenwriting. Uh, the acting was okay, I guess. But then once again, is that this is a movie that someone goes into a safety tank. Is like I don't think that the threshold is the high. Yep. No, I just I didn't like the movie at all. And also transmitters in his hair. <laughs> they just kept saying that. <laughs> they put transmitters in my hair and I'm like <laughs> You could have at least done something more realistic than Oh, but one thing is that they have nanotechnology. So is like he's supposedly like microscopically small. But instead of actually going on your skin, instead of actually just fetching into your skin, it remains on your hair. So you can just save it off. Even if you well, unless you're unless you're completely covered in shit, then it doesn't work. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's basically like a lead cover room. 
you know, it's like no signal can go outside of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I got so annoyed when he was talking about the technology, the bad guy early on. And they're like, it's amazing. It sticks to all surfaces. We, we can track people anywhere, but it doesn't deal well with mud. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, oh, we, okay. we, yeah. Yeah, I see. Here we go. All right. So should we score this masterpiece? Uh, so scoring this piece of shit. Um, <laughs> Who should go first? I think that is my turn to go first. Yeah, I picked it. So this is yours. Uh, I'm pretty torn about it because if I try to uh, if I try to think about this movie as a whole, about like a you know as I was saying earlier about a thriller that I watch at two p.m. and I'm about to fall asleep. Is like it's not the most insulting thing that I could watch. But if I try to compare with anything else that we have watched, for example, is that we gave a four to blow up. Is that blow up was trying to do something. This movie wasn't. I don't think that there is any attack. So my score. score first if you want. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I was going to give it a two. They just give it a two. Two, man. <laughs> That's completely fine. I mean, I, the only reason I would give it a 3.5 and not something even lower is because I think that partially is interesting. I think that is not catered to us. I think that it's exactly the same case as Paddington 2. Is that for the audience that they had in mind, is that this is okay. I won't say that it's like they're going to be like opening their eyes and just open their minds to something better, but it's like it's going to be the entertainment that they can enjoy. For me, is that this was, I laugh quite a bit in a couple of the scenes. Like, no, no. Because it was intentionally black comedy or because? No, because it was like, how come, how come someone has really lied at this? I don't, yeah, I don't. Well, I mean, it got a BAFTA nom, so. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> I think that this may be like one of those few cases that I gave a significantly higher score than yours. <laughs> yeah, but if you think about it, is this memorable? No. I won't remember no. a single of the stupid <laughs> twists and turns in six months. That's true. There's, I could not even imagine recommending this to anyone. Like, oh my God, I saw this interesting Norwegian film. <laughs> I should check it out. <laughs> Maybe to look interesting to other people that you know that they're never going to be like watching the movie. And they weren't... I, they, I don't... I guess I see what they were trying to do, but even like the level of difficulty of what they were trying to do, I feel like it isn't that hard. I don't know. This is just a fail. It's it's a fail. This is the worst thing we watched, I think. You think? You think that it's worse than Celine Dion goes body? But at least that had that like high brow pretension aspect to it with the stream of consciousness thing, the no, sir. they're the <sighs> I don't. Oh. Let me just say what I gave to Celine Dion Cosporty. God, I love that one. Uh, I give it a three. I cannot give objectively something higher to this. What, what did I give to Celine? Uh, you give it a 2.5, I think. 2.5, yeah. And you get to I this feel good. Two. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a good. It's just a step below Celine Cosporty. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give this a 2.5. You changed it from 3.5? To 2.5. No, because you actually make a good point about like Celine and Julie go boarding is a better exercise than this. It's an exercise, just to begin with. This is yes. not an exercise. No. I won't say that this is painful, you know, but it's like I would say like this is nothing. This is something it was that... less than nothing. So I watched, I watched three movies since the last time that we talked. Wow. I watched this, I watched Superior, and I watched The Arrangement. I feel... Okay, wait. What's the arrangement? The arrangement is this movie with Michelle Rodriguez that I told you about. Oh, yes. The Exchange, you know? Uh-huh. And Sigourney Weaver. I can tell you this is the worst of the three. Wow. This is worse than the arrangement. Because the arrangement is so bad that it's enjoyable because it looks that there are like some choices that were like deliberately made for just making the movie bad. Yes. So you have... Yeah. So, but the, in this one, no. In this one, I had the feeling that someone thought is that like, this is going to be like quality entertainment, and it's true that like, for some people, this may actually fulfill their needs. But even those people are not going to be remembered in this movie 
there is nothing that is aesthetically pleasing except the dog. Oh, Oscar has joined the podcast. He's very, very old dachshund with security issues. <laughs> um, so I don't know if we should get into this because I might get really upset, but what did you think about Suspiria? I like it. it but did you mean you adore it? I didn't adore it, and I assume that you adore it because Tom York did the, uh, did the soundtrack. No, no. <laughs> that director think, is amazing. And Tilda Swinton, and Tilda Swinton plays three different roles that until I didn't check the cast, I didn't realize about it. Like, holy shit, she did that one. That one is amazing. Oh, wow. Like, the doctor? Yeah. She plays the doctor. I mean, I was like, how? Oh, yeah. how? That's I amazing. I, did I, mean, that I didn't. And I was like, until I watched it like afterwards, she said, wow. That's incredible. Is it the part about like the uh, the other mother, Mother Marcus? She uh-huh. playing that role is like, sure, I can see that. That's the kind of craziness that Tilda Swinton would do. But it's like just having the other role is like, this is, this is properly act. You know, it's true that he doesn't talk too much, you know, and probably there was some kind of voiceover or voice modification, but I found it interesting. I love how 70s it feels. Oh, it feels so 70s. Yeah, but it's like it reminds me a bit of uh, how Mandy feels. If it's like this movie could have done in the 70s. Mm. And Mandy feels yeah. like a movie that could have done in the 80s. It's like it doesn't feel like a nostalgic trip. It feels like he actually took a lot of effort for just making the movie feel like a 70s movie. Have, I have have to, you seen the original? I haven't. That's what yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, a part of me is tempted, but I had the feeling that it's like just knowing some of the world from the Argento is going to be a bit more tacky yeah i think it's going to be a product of its time yeah super dated super super dated uh the dance scene i really like the dance scenes on uh on a superior i think that they are not as impressive as a climax Uh, yeah and besides that in climax they feel like way more authentic just being like just a single shot is a well in some of those scenes i look we're not going to be like repeating that specific move you know is that these are some of them are like pretty cool, you know, like pretty sophisticated, you know, but they don't have that kind of freshness that Climax has. Yeah, I can see that. I yeah. fucking love Suspiria. I thought that movie was amazing. I cannot believe it bombed at the box office, and it bombed. Well, I mean, I believe nobody it. liked it. I mean, I believe it from the perspective that it's still a bit non-mainstream at all, you know. Is that when I finished watching, it's like, okay, what did I watch? Is that it, did this really happen, you know, all of this? Or did I imagine like part of this? So it's a movie that I think that it actually has the problem of uh, just living up to the original, you know? It's like all the kind of mythology that they build into the world is something that I see on the yard gentle. It's something, what is the name of, uh, of the director? Luca Guadagnino. You know, it's something that I wouldn't expect from Luca Guadagnino nowadays, but you cannot remove like all the mythology that he builds into it. You cannot remove like these three entities that they were below because otherwise you have like they're witches and they're pretty bad. You have to have <laughs> that. You have to have like that kind of suspiriorum at the end yeah. for actually just completing the circle and just having the contrast into, okay, she was like a, a Susie was racing in Idaho, was it? Omaha, I'm Omaha. Pretty sure it's like Nebraska or Ohio or yeah. So is that she was not built... Idaho. Sorry, <laughs> uh, she was built into this very. She was a uh, upbringing. Her upbringing was in this very conservative religious family, and she actually is one of these very dark entities. You know, so I had a feeling. Okay, the contrast is also pretty good. It works well, but then it has this kind of pulp feeling. That is like by nowadays a standard, people are going to feel like pretty weird about it. I like yeah, it. Especially the, the scene where, like the final climax after the spell, that was so 70s to me when she goes around and. Oh, just kills everyone and yeah, she just kills the death. Basically. Yeah, like boom, yeah. boom, boom. Your head explodes, your head explodes. <laughs> He's like, what do you want? I want to die. He's like, okay, you're dead. It was like Lucas said, don't use any special effects techniques developed since 1975. Whatever existed beforehand, you can use that for this scene. Oh, you, don't you think that the head exploding is something like CGI? I felt like it was CGI. Uh, like it may or may not have body. been CGI, but I felt like that just looked... <laughs> Hello? 
Yep. I'm oh, you just got, just got for a second. Uh, what it really felt like pretty 70s and non special effects is when she and stuff like that's walking up to the podium at the end of that climax scene and they start using like a bit more of a slow motion, you know, kind of thing, like just fading the image while they start like just spinning together, all the girls. Mm-hmm. So I like it. I thought that from an aesthetic perspective, it was great. Now, the first search that I did after watching the movie is like, why? Why did a Suspiria remake happen? <laughs> because I I'm a surprise. loved the original, right? Exactly. Yeah, he actually had the license for doing the remake for 10 years or something until he decided wow. to do it. So he loved the original, probably from his early steps on the uh, directing career. And he wanted to do it, but it felt like it's surprising. You know, it's unexpected to see a Dario Argento remake. And a remake that is so pop so like just embracing what the original version was in the 70s so when we're talking about a like bold cinema last time it's like i think that this is bold cinema for sure but for at the sure same, it was yeah but at the same time it's not bold per se it's bold because the original was pretty bold and he actually embraced that boldness i think he's a bold filmmaker did you see i am love no i you only was watch this it. and call me by your name from him watch i am love Amazing. Tilda Swinton also stars in that. What isn't isn't she like her fit, sort of his fetish actress or something? His her like his muse. Yeah, she's in two or was sort of like three or four movies, I think. Uh, I only know for sure about Suspiria and I Am Love. Yeah, but yeah, I watched an interview with Tilda Swinton where I Am Love just came out of a conversation the two of them were having as friends, and they're like, "We should make this into a movie." <laughs> That's pretty so. cool. Now watch it. I mean, I have to say that out of the three is like Suspiria, I think that is, I wouldn't call it a masterpiece. We're not going to be scoring it. It's so weird. It's, it's really weird, man. I mean, it's like, just given the original work, what he does is amazing. But it's like, it's still like, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Who actually relied on this? Just well, why does because he need a reason? He made a fantastic movie. Or even if he you don't think it's fantastic, it's just a good movie. No, 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 no. I mean, I think that it's a fantastic movie. He actually just let me like, wow, is that this is crazy. You know, that you actually could actually make something like this and it works well, you know? I have to say that I like Climax more. And, but and these are the two only you movies. You like Climax more than Suspiria? As From a whole? A, as a whole, I don't know, but as an aesthetic exercise that it comes to, it boils down to dancing, I like Climax more. Uh, besides that, it surprised me a lot, you know, all the scenes that they are a single take, that they are like really long. Climax, yeah. Climax. Super cool climax, yeah. Is that from a directing perspective, I felt like, wow, that's amazing. You know, it's a bit more of a, uh, not guttural, you know, a bit more like primal kind of thing. But this, I think that it's a bit more of a sophisticated product. It's like he's clear. Suspiria. That, Suspiria. Okay. Suspiria is a way more of a sophisticated product. It's like he actually thought about, okay, I want to shoot this as if it was shot. If Dario Argento had Amazon Prime, sorry, like Prime Studios or Amazon Studios, giving them a blank check. Well, happy. And it's like, yep, yeah, that, that would be like pretty accurate. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That was, uh, that came out in 2019, right? That was one of my favorite movies of 2019. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it was one or two years ago, but yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's good. Two. Yeah, I think that it was two, like towards the end of the year in 2018, I think. I think that that was like a really good movie. I mean, I was like really, really surprised, especially when I checked that it's like, Why? I, think it was I told close. you it was good. But you also told me to watch uh, Headhunter, so <laughs> <laughs> let's just leave it in the middle ground, okay? So wait, wait, <laughs> did, you, did you dislike Headhunters more or that shitty Lars von Trier comedy? I dislike it this more. Wow. But I mean, just we, the problem with, uh, with that movie, the boss of it all, is that I gave it a five to that movie. Is that there is nothing special about it, but is that there is nothing that wrong about it. Is that this movie doesn't know what it is. But it's not offensively bad, like Headhunters. <laughs> well, no, that's what I mean. It's like Headhunters doesn't know what it is. Yeah. Doesn't know what it's trying to be. It tries to be a fable. Is that you could actually change this? Is that you could actually change the uh, the characters for animals? I just making an anthropomorphic version, and it would be a fable. Yep, I agree. <laughs> it's just really good. It's a joke. It's a joke, but it's like it's a joke that doesn't know that it's a joke, 
and he tries oh, to yeah. take himself seriously. He said the boss of it all, he doesn't try to take himself seriously. He doesn't try to elevate Nordic cinema. He didn't try to do anything except yeah. be clever, and it failed. Yeah. Well, and you give it a... <laughs> sure. Uh, but yeah, I think that I don't have more to say. I could say that the arrangement is so bad that it's good. Well, I'll probably watch that at some point. But it, I will tell you, it's, like, it's not a good movie. It's like it, it's only enjoyable if you enjoy bad cinema. Oh, I do, for sure. So, and besides that, if you like from full frontal horse size dicks, <laughs> CGI, now. CGI, because Michelle like Rodriguez that. also plays his male counterpart. And the funny thing is that she is more masculine when she's playing herself as a female. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I think that Michelle Rodriguez was not ready for playing her male counterpart, but, you know, the CGI was there, and her dick is humongous. Well, I'm going to watch that right now. Yeah, you should. At least that I seen it, because I thought about you when I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we watching next? Uh, so for the next one, we're watching Memory of a Murder. We're going back to Korean cinema again. You have a type. Yeah. Jose <laughs> is an Asian fetish. No, I have many fetishes. I don't discriminate my race, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, man. Well, this was fun. Good chat. Wash your yeah. hands. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye.